our store is, as you can tell, extremely small. So we have to choose very carefully what we carry in this store. So we'd like to think of it as, in a way, curated. But one of the toughest questions we ever have from customers coming in wanting recommendations is, can you give me something that's really well written that's also funny? <laughs> and that's a hard order for us to fill here. But thankfully, we have three books from Gary that fit that bill extraordinarily well. Um, some of you may have seen the trailer for this book online. If you haven't, I encourage you to see it. It's got, uh, it's got Edmund White, who's a great friend of the store, and Mary Gainskill, also a friend of the store, and of course it has Gary, um, and it has his class at Columbia. Um, we are extraordinarily proud to have him here. One thing I will say about this book is as funny as the trailer is, this book exceeds it. Uh, it's an extraordinary book, getting great reviews. We're very proud and privileged to have him here. Thank you for coming, Gary Steingart. Thank you. Thank you for that great intro, and thank you really for coming out on a rainy Mad Men night. I know that. Yeah, right. I hope everyone's close to their home so you can just rush back. Um, did someone email me about a suckling pig? Yeah, okay, got it. Got it. So, just checking. Uh, you know. Oh, come on, you're not going to leave it at that. <laughs> no, I think I have to. <laughs> there are laws, you know. There are laws. Um, so yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, I've always stopped by this store and, and, and picked up a lot of books. Uh, this is Super Sad True Love Story, uh, which uh, has a nice scratch and sniff kind of cover. Uh, very exciting. Uh, or Twister for Dachshunds, if you will. <laughs> Many uses. Um, I know there are Dachshunds uh, out there. So uh, a few notes about this book. Uh, it is, uh, uh, I hate to give explanatory you know, information about books. It feels like it says a real science fiction kind of novel, you know. So 10 centuries from hence, uh, the planet Mordor is invading the Humantashen <laughs> Empire. And, uh, <laughs> various, you know, no, I'm sorry, I already offended every science fiction fan out there. Uh, it's set very slightly in the future. A completely illiterate America is about to fall apart. So uh, next Tuesday, <laughs> what we're looking at. Um, there's a, a one ruling party left, it's the Bipartisan Party. And it's under the leadership of uh, Defense Secretary Rubenstein, who is my first Jewish strongman. Very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, is right. <laughs> the device that everyone wears is called the apparat. Okay, it's worn as a pendant. Um, and what it does is it immediately ranks you. It has rank, rank me plus technology. So as soon as someone, I walk into a bar, let's say, and I'm told immediately I'm the 17th ugliest man in the bar, but have the fourth best credit rating, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so everyone is constantly ranking everyone else on the streets and the bars everywhere. Uh, there's two main characters, Russian Abramov, uh, Russian American Lenny Abramov. He's the narrator of the section I'm about to read. He is approaching his 40s, which means that he is way over the hill for the society. Uh, and he works for a company called Post Human Services, which is trying to find a cure for death. He has a yeah, not so well it's going. <laughs> not so well. Uh, and he has a younger uh, Korean-American girlfriend named Eunice Park. Uh, Lenny likes to read books, which is verboten in the society. Books by the younger generation are not read. They consider, people consider that they have a bad smell. Uh, so in this scene, they're going to go back to uh, meet Lenny's parents on Long Island. The next day, Eunice and I took the Long Island Railroad to Westbury, Long Island, to meet my parents, the Abramovs. The love I felt for Eunice on that train ride had a capital and provinces, parishes and a Vatican, an orange planet and many sullen moons. It was systemic and it was complete. Eunice was nervous almost to the point of quaking. Her outfit was conservative for the occasion. A sky blue blouse with a Peter Pan collar and white buttons, pleated wool skirt reaching down below the knees, a black ribbon tied around the neck. From certain angles, she looked like one of the Orthodox Jewish women who have overrun my co-op building. There she was sweating so handsomely on her orange pleather L-I-R-R -R seat. Her elder worship and elder fear brought out a strange immigrant pride in me. There was something else, too. It was on the Long Island Railroad some 20 years ago that I had had my first crush on a Korean girl. I had been a freshman at a prestigious math and science high school in Tribeca. Uh, most of the other kids were Asian, and although technically you had to live within New York City to go to the school, there were more than a few of us who faked our residency and commuted from various parcels of Long Island. For me, the long ride to Westbury amidst dozens of my fellow nerd students was a particularly difficult one because it was public knowledge at the science high school. 
uh, that my weighted average was a dismal 86.894, while at least 91.553 had been recommended for entry into Cornell or the University of Pennsylvania, the weakest of the Ivy League schools. As immigrant children from high-performing nations, we knew our parents would slap us across the mouth for anything less than Cornell. Several of the Korean and Chinese boys who took the railroad with me, their spiky hair still haunts my most literal dreams, would dance around me singing my average, 86.894, 86.894. You won't even get into Oberlin with that, they said. <laughs> Have fun at NYU, Abramo. Yeah, yeah, see you at the University of Chicago. It's the teacher of teachers. <laughs> But there was one girl, another Eunice, a Eunice Choi to be exact, a tall, quiet beauty who would pry the boys away from me while shouting, it's not Lenny's fault he can't do well in school. Remember what Reverend Sung says in church? We're all different. We all have different abilities. Remember the fall of man? We're all fallen creatures. And then she'd sit down with me and unbidden help me with my impossible chemistry homework, moving the strange letters and numbers around my notebook until the equations were for some reason deemed balanced while I utterly unbalanced by the magical girl next to me, her skin glowing beneath her summer gym shorts and orange Princeton jersey, tried to catch a brief smell of her hair or a brush of her hard elbow. It was the first time a woman had risen up to defend me, had given me the idea that I actually should be defended, that I wasn't a bad person, just not as skilled at life as some others. At Westbury, Eunice and I disembarked before an armored personnel carrier sitting by the squad station house, its 50 caliber Browning gun bouncing up and down. National Guardsmen were surveying the diverse crowd, Salvadorans and Irish and South Asians and Jews and whoever else had chosen to make this corner of central Long Island the rich, smelly tapestry it had now become. The troops appeared angrier and more sunburned than usual. Perhaps they had just been rotated out of Venezuela. We're fighting in Venezuela at this point. <laughs> it's not going well. <laughs> Beside the armored personnel carrier, a sign read, It is forbidden to acknowledge the existence of this armored personnel carrier, the object. By reading the sign, you have denied existence of the object and implied consent. We took a cab to the corner of Washington Avenue and Myron, the most important corner of my life. I could already see my parents' brownish, half-brick, half-stucco cape, the golden mailbox out in front, the faux 19th century lamp beside it, the cheap lawn chairs stacked on the island of cement that was supposed to be the front porch, and the gigantic flags of the United States and Israel billowing in the breeze from two flagpoles. I felt a little embarrassed because I knew that Eunice's parents were much better off than mine. At the door, my mother appeared in her usual household outfit, white bra and panties. <laughs> she was about to throw her arms around my neck when she noticed Eunice, let out some Russian garble of amazement, and retreated inside the house, leaving me, per the usual, with the visuals of her thick breasts and white little round of belly. My father, shirtless, soon took her place, also gasped at Eunice, ran his hand against his naked, muscular breast, said, whoa, then hugged me. <laughs> there was hair against my new dress shirt, the gray carpet of hair that my father wore with an odd touch of class, as if he were a royal in some tropical country. <laughs> he kissed me on both cheeks, and I did the same, feeling the instructions, the code of Russian father-son relations. Father means I have to love him, have to listen to him, can't offend him, can't hurt him, can't bring him to task for past wrongs. He's an old man now, defenseless. My mother reappeared in shorts and a white beater. Sunochek, little son, she shouted. Look who's come to us, Lash Lubimitz, our favorite. She shook Eunice's hand and both of my parents swiftly evaluated her, affirmed that she was, like her predecessors, not Jewish, but quietly approved of the fact that she was thin and attractive with a healthy black mane of hair. My mother unwrapped her own precious blonde locks from the green handkerchief that kept them safe from the American sun and smiled prettily at Eunice, she began talking in her brave post-retirement English about how glad she was to have a potential daughter-in-law, filling in the contours of her loneliness with rapid-fire questions about my mysterious life in faraway New York. Does Lenny keep clean house? Does he vacuum? Once I come to college dormitorium. Oh, awful. Such smell. Dead ficus tree. Old cheese on table. Socks hanging in window. <laughs> Eunice smiled and spoke in my favor. He's very good, Miss Abramma, she said. He's very, very clean. I looked at her with love. Somewhere beneath the bright suburban skies, I felt the presence of a 50 caliber Browning gun swiveling toward an incoming Long Island Railroad train, but here I stood, surrounded by the people who loved me. 
I brought Tagamet from the discount pharmacy, I said to my father, taking five boxes out of the bag I brought. Thank you, Malinke, little one, my father said, taking hold of his beloved drug. Peptic ulcer, he said to Eunice, pointing at the depth of his tortured stomach. My mother had already grabbed hold of the back of my head and was madly stroking my hair. So gray, she said. So old he gets, almost 40. Lonya, what is happening to you? Too much stress? Also losing hair. Oh, my God. <laughs> you are named Eunice, my father said. Do you know where it comes from, such name? My parents, Eunice gamely began. No, it's from the Greek, Unike, meaning victorious. He laughed, happy to demonstrate that before he was forced to be a janitor in America, he had served as a quasi-intellectual and minor dandy on Moscow's Arbat Street. So I hope, he said, that in life you will be victorious also. Who cares about Greek, Boris, my mother said. Look at how she is beautiful. The fact that my parents admired Eunice's looks and capacity for victory brightened me quite a bit. <laughs> All these years, and I still craved their approval, still longed for the carrot and stick of their 19th century child-rearing, I instructed myself to lower the heat of my emotions, to think without the family blood bursting at my temples. But I was 12 years old as soon as I passed the mezuzah at the front door. <laughs> my father began to lead me to the living room couch for our usual heart-to-heart. -heart. My mother rushed over to the couch with a garbage bag, which she draped over the place where I was about to sit in my compromised Manhattan outerwear. <laughs> took Eunice to the kitchen, chatting gaily to her potential daughter-in-law about how guys can be so dirty, you know, and how she had just built a new storage device for her many mops. <laughs> <laughs> On the couch, my father draped his arm around my shoulder and said, so tell me. I breathed in the same breath as he did, as if we were connected. I felt his age seep into mine, as if he were the forward guard of my own mortality. I spoke in English with the tantalizing hints of Russian I had studied haphazardly at NYU, the foreign words like raisins shining out of a loaf. I spoke about work, about my assets, about the most recent fairly positive valuation of my 740 square foot Manhattan apartment, about all the monetary things that kept us fearful and connected. He held up the new apparat pendant I wore around my neck. How much, he said, turning the thing over colorful data and rankings pouring over his hairy fingers. When I explained that the device was given to me at work, he made a happy snort and said in English, ah, learn new technology for free, it's good. The floor beneath my feet was clean, immigrant clean, clean enough so that you understood that somebody had done their best. My father had two old fashioned television screens stapled to the walls above my mother's fanatically waxed mantelpiece. <laughs> There's only two uh, networks left, uh, Fox Liberty Prime and Fox Liberty Ultra. <laughs> <laughs> One television was set to a Fox Liberty Prime stream, which was showing the growing tense city in Central Park, the homeless people now spreading from the backyard of the Metropolitan, over Hill and Dale, all the way down to the Sheep's Meadow. On the other screen, Fox Liberty Ultra was viciously broadcasting the arrival of the Chinese central banker at Andrews Air Force Base, our president and his pretty wife trying not to shiver in the bleak Maryland downpour. When I asked my father how he was feeling, he pointed at his heartburn and then began to talk about the news on the fox. Speaking sometimes in English and sometimes in the complicated Russian sentences that English had denied him, he praised Defense Secretary Rubenstein, talked about all that he and the bipartisan party had done for our country, and how with Rubenstein's blessing, security state Israel could now use the nuclear option against the Arabs and the Persians. In particular, he said, against Damascus which, if winds are properly positioned, with the help of God, will carry fallout and poison cloud in direction of Tehran and Baghdad, and not Yerushalayim and Tel Aviv. I felt my father's breath against my cheek for 20 minutes as he talked about his complex political life, then excused myself, unwound from his humid embrace, and went to the upstairs bathroom as my mother shouted to me from the kitchen, Lenny, don't take your shoes off in upstairs bathroom. Papa has gribok. Athlete's foot. <laughs> in the contaminated bathroom, <laughs> I admired the strange blob of plastic with wooden spokes that kept my mother's serious mop collection in ready-to-access mode. Although my parents never had a good word to say about the country now known as Holy Petrol Russia, the hallways were hung with framed sepia tone postcards of Red Square and the Kremlin, the snow-dusted equestrian statue of Prince Yuri Dolgoruki, founder of Moscow, and the Gothic Stalin era skyscraper of prestigious Mo Moscow State University, which neither of my parents had attended because to hear them tell it 
Jews were not allowed in back then. As for me, I have never been to Russia. I have not had the chance to learn to love it and hate it like my parents. I have my own dying empire to contend with. I do not wish for any other. My bedroom was nearly empty. All the traces of my habitation, the posters and little bits of crap from my travels were gone. I reveled in the smallness, the coziness of an upstairs bedroom in a traditional American Cape Cod house, the half floor that forces you to duck to feel small and naive again. I cannot begin to tell you how much the purchase of this house, of each tiny bedroom, had meant to my family and to me. I still remember the signing at the real estate lawyer's office, the three of us mentally forgiving each other for a decade and a half worth of sins, the youthful beatings administered by my father, my mother's anxieties and manias, my own teenage sullenness, because the janitor and his wife had done something right at last, and it would all be okay now. There was no turning back from this, from this glorious fortune we had been granted in the middle of Long Island, from the carefully clipped bushes by the mailbox, our bushes, Abrahamic bushes, to the often mentioned Californian possibility of an, of an above ground swimming pool in the tiny backyard. Down in the dining room with the shiny Romanian furniture the Abramovs had imported from their Moscow apartments, the table was laid out in a hospitable Russian manner with everything from four different kinds of salami to a plate of chewy tongue to every little fish that had ever inhabited the Baltic Sea, <laughs> not to mention the sacred little dash of black caviar. <coughs> Eunice sat Queen Esther-like in her orthodox getup at the ceremonial end of the table upon a fluffed-up Passover pillow, frowning at the attention unsure of how to deal with the strange currents of love and its opposite that circulated in the fish-smelling air. My father proposed a seasonal toast in English, to the creator who created America, land of free, and who give us defense secretary Rubinstein, who kill Arab, and to love, which is blooming in such time between my son and Unike, who, big wink to Eunice, will be victorious like Sparta over Athens, and to the summer, which is most conducive season to love, although some may say spring, <laughs> While he went on in his booming voice, a shot glass shaking in his troubled hand, my mother, bored out of her mind, leaned over to me and said, By the way, your Eunice has very pretty teeth. Maybe you will marry her. <laughs> <laughs> I could see Eunice's mind absorbing the basics of my father's speech. Arabs bad, Jews good, Chinese central banker possibly okay, America always number one in his heart while she gauged the intent on my mother's face as she spoke to me in Russian. Eunice's mind moved so quickly through feelings and ideas, but the fear in her face reflected a life rushing by faster than she could make sense of it. The toast finally complete, we dove into the food without reservation, all of us from countries historically strangled by starvation, none of us strangers to salt and brine. Eunice, my mother said, perhaps you can answer for me this. Who is Lenny by profession? I can never figure out. He went to NYU business school, so he is what, businessman? <coughs> Mama, I said, please, not now, not now. I am talking to Eunice, my mother said. You know, girls talk. <laughs> I had never seen Eunice's face so serious, even as the tail end of a Baltic sardine disappeared between her glossy lips. <laughs> Lenny does very important work, she told my mother. It's, I think, like medicine? He helps people live forever? My father's fist slammed the dining table. Impossible, he cried. It breaks every law of physics and biology, for one. For two, immoral against God. I would not want such thing. Pooh. Work is work, my mother said. If stupid rich American wants to live forever and Lenny makes money, why do you care? <laughs> she waved her hand at my father. Stupid, she said. Mm -hmm. Yes, but how Lenny knows about medicine, my father lit up, brandishing a fork capped by a marinated mushroom. He never studied in high school. What is his weighted average? 86.894. <laughs> My mother waved him off again and turned to Eunice. So you met Lenny in Italy, she said. Lenny tells us you speak perfect Italian. Eunice blushed some more. No, she said, lowering her eyes and cupping her knees. I'm forgetting everything, the irregular verbs. Ha, now Lenny spends one year in Italy, my father said. We come to visit him. He speaks nothing. Blah, 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 blah. He moved his body to imitate my walking through the Roman streets while trying to talk to the natives. You are a liar, Boris, my mother said casually. He bought this beautiful tomato in market. He brought down price, three euro. <laughs> but tomato is so simple, my father said. In Russian, pomodoro. In Italian, pomodoro. Even I know such thing. If he maybe negotiate for us cucumber or squash. <laughs> 
Shut up already, Boris, my mother said. She readjusted her summer blouse and bored her eyes into mine. Lenny, she said, we see you appear on Apparat stream. A hundred and one people we need to feel sorry for. <laughs> Why do you do it? <laughs> Your colleague, he makes fun of you. He says you are fat and stupid and old. You don't eat good food and you do not have profession and your fuckability rankings are very low. <laughs> <laughs> also, he says, Tibia Panizili, you've been demoted at the company you work. Papa and I are very sad about this. My father looked away in some shame while I curled and uncurled my toes beneath the table. I told him so many times not to look at any apparat streams or data about me. I was a private person with my own little world. Why couldn't they find a better use for their retirement years than this painful scrutiny of their only child? Why did they stalk me with their tomatoes and high school averages and who are you by profession logic? And then I heard Eunice speak, her straightforward American English ringing against the smallness of our house. I told him not to appear in it, too, she said. And he won't anymore. You won't, right, Lenny? You're so good and smart. Why do you need to do it? Exactly, my mother said. Exactly, Eunice. I did not say anything. I leaned back and watched the two women in my life look across a glossy Romanian table, groaning beneath a plastic cover and 20 <laughs> gallons of mayonnaise and canned fish. <laughs> they were eyeing each other with a placid understanding. Sometimes mothers and girlfriends compete against one another but that has never been my experience. It is quite easy for two smart women, no matter what the gap in their age and background, to come to a complete agreement about me. This child, they seem to be saying to each other, this child still needs to be brought up. Thank you. Questions or concerns or complaints? <laughs> I'm concerned that she was wearing a wife beater. Oh, you know what a wife beater is? I do. Okay, yes. It's very handy <laughs> in the summer, you know. <laughs> Sure. But then you said she was clutching her, bra her blouse. She changed for the movie. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very good, very good. This is like uh, when I do readings in Germany, you know. You know they're always like, yeah, well, okay, but on page 240, he was wearing a green sweater. But on 320, it's magically brown. Maybe you live in a country where the sweaters magically change colors. Not here. And also, we don't like your invasion of Iraq. Um, I was wondering how much your uh, character from uh, Surge Day, uh, your protagonist, was informed by John Kennedy Tools' novel? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, John Kennedy Tools' novel, uh, Confederacy of Dunces. Right. Um, there were two, well, Confederacy of Dunces, of course, was on my mind, but there is a Russian um, Confederacy of Dunces type book, not exactly, but it's Goncharov's Oblomov, which was written in the 19th century, also about a ginormous man who never gets out of bed. Uh, <laughs> that was sort of even more closer to, because he always beats his um, manservant. And, and Misha in that book also beats his man's rhythm. So, uh, where did I steal from more? Uh, more from Vincenzo than just a little bit. No, no, I mean, I'm perfectly fine to acknowledge grand theft, uh, literary grand theft. Better steal outright. Yeah, better steal outright, then. that's right. <laughs> the lawsuits are pending for Vincenzo's estate. Uh, all right, so you have this device in the uh, book that uh, that uh, monitors your your rating, but you're also, you're also all over on Facebook. Yeah. So is uh, is there a contradiction in doing that? Yeah, yeah, I'm all over Facebook. Uh, mostly talking about dachshunds and and my carb intake and stuff like that. Um, for this book. Uh, I had to delve into the world of, of social media and also got an eye telephone the whole nine yards. I had a, an intern, a wonderful intern. Uh, it was uh, my first male intern. All my friends called him the man turn, you know. <laughs> uh, I'm going to write, a, I think, a script for Hollywood called the man turn. Uh, where was I? Oh, yes, the man turn. So the man turn taught me all about science because I know nothing about it. So he explained uh, protons and neutrons and how a cell becomes a whatever. Uh, and he also got me into this Facebooking thing, and then also the iPhone. So, uh, and my life's been destroyed by all this technology. I, I, I think you're on this thing. Yeah, yeah it's, destroying, my, it's destroying my life also. It's destroying everything for me. Now I'm just on it all the time. There's no rest. And um, 
so you know, <laughs> I feel like I'm I'm dying for people's sins by by going on this thing, uh, very Christ-like. So, so you're gonna like cancel all your accounts and smack your iPhone? Well, with like heroin, it's something. too addictive now. I can't stop using it. I can't stop using. It. I haven't, you know, since I've been on here, I haven't checked my uh, emails. It's been horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> the last 23 minutes were so long. <laughs> not that you're not great, yeah. but yeah. Well, I just thought about the the narrative pushing it into the future and using it as a frame for the discussions in, in your in your novel. Could you just talk about that a little bit? You're using a, um, you started out talking about a science fiction uh, frame in the beginning. Is that, is it, was it easier for you to talk about the elements of your theme in your book by going into the future as opposed to contemporary times? Well, here's the thing. So I grew up on science fiction. Uh, I, I've always loved science fiction. I've loved dystopian fiction. You know, I went straight from the Soviet Union to Hebrew school, so dystopia <laughs> is, is what I know best. Uh, there's no question about that. So I grew up in 1984, Brave New World, uh, the Matins, we in Russia, you know. Um, but I don't know much, like I was saying, I don't know much about science. And as the book progressed, I have a wonderful editor at Random House, David Ebershop, who's also a great author in his own right. And, you know, we went through about eight drafts, and each draft, what he did was, was, you know, he said, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Let's just dial back all of the science stuff and talk about, you know, talk about the love, you know. Um, so no, I have very little science, um, and I think that worked out very well for this book. Um, and also, without definitively set, saying when it's set, that's the other thing about this book. It, could be, it really could be next Tuesday, the way, the way our technology is moving. So I took a lot of... In, in the end, uh, I took a lot of the science fiction away, but I think the dystopian element continues, and that's very much a 1984 kind of thing for me, because I think Brave New World's a much more interesting novel of ideas, but you remember 1984 because of Julie and Winston, because they love each other, and the state won't let it happen. You know, And I think that's sort of what inspired uh, Lenny and Eunice in, in this book as well. I loved, um, the, is it teening? Like teening, yes. Did that really come natural, or was that... Uh... I, I'm very lucky to know a lot of young people, you know, and I, I, I spent some time at the hanging out in the quad of Columbia University where I teach and just taking down, <laughs> wow, what are they doing to my language, you know? <laughs> These are, of course, our brightest students. Uh, um, so it's, it's uh, teening, all the other stuff that exists in this book. You know, it's not so far, I, I've learned some wonderful acronyms, uh, Abbreviations, I should say, like Rolf Larp rolling on the floor while looking at addictive rodent pornography. <laughs> <laughs> that that actually exists. I, I saw that. I have a uh, Timatov in this book, which sounds like a Hebrew word, but it's what Eunice always see, says when she sees Lenny naked, which is, uh, I think I'm about to openly vomit. <laughs> so it was fun. It was fun working with these abbreviations. Look, language evolves. I'm not going to be some curmudgeon here saying, oh, God, these kids and their language. I mean, it's fine. You know, it's just... I miss I miss the way we used to speak back in the back in Queens back in the day. You know that was that was really literate. <laughs> I'm just wondering about uh, where your idea for the pendant came from, and is it in the novel? Is it something you wear um, freely, or are you forced to by the government? You're not forced to by the government. Uh, people wear it freely; they can't exist without it. It's the thing that ranks them. People need to be ranked all the time. So it's like uh, Facebook and your credit score together. It's even more. It's everything. It's it's uh, it even measures your pulse so that somebody knows when you're turned on by them. Um, <laughs> no, it does absolutely everything, uh, and it's impossible. To the only people that don't have it are the very very wealthy because they don't need it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh. Can you tell me a little bit more about the daughter and what happens to you? You haven't read the book. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, I don't want to give too much away, but it's 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 not good for anyone. Uh, <laughs> Not good. Ask me after the reading. I'll, I'll tell you exactly what happened. Oof. Oh, maron. Yeah. I read that um, Bill Gates' house, which is 64,000 square feet, people wear microchips yeah. that basically reprogram the temperature and the music in all the rooms wherever they go. And there's a ranking system where the higher ranking individual gets their music and temperature. That's brilliant. See, this is the problem with writing about the present. The present no longer exists. <laughs> we are living in the future all the time. It's happening right now, you know. This is why uh, novelists used to have it so much better. You know, Tolstoy, 1860s, he was writing about 1812. A horse was a horse. A carriage was a carriage. There was no killer app that he had to worry about all the time. You know? There was just an ad today on television about a device, <clears throat> how your computer or whatever device you have will make you a better person 
for example, you get on the scale, <clears throat> you're trying to lose weight, and you tell everybody on Facebook how much weight you want to lose, and then you get on the scale, and this is somehow hooked up to your various devices so that uh, people can write back to you and say, congratulations, you just <laughs> lost two pounds. I'm serious. I mean, so here we are. I'd love to have a device where every time I have a drink, it just says, you're killing yourself. <laughs> 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 no, <I didn't>. <laughs> <laughs> How much of your work is autobiographical? That's a great question. I always get that question. Um, you, they're like, how do you write about a, you know, a, a, a small, balding Russian guy like that? <laughs> <laughs> but the, the differences are stark. He's five foot nine, I'm five foot six. Uh, his bald spot in the beginning is shaped like the great state of Ohio, whereas mine is more like uh, West Virginia or something. So these are huge differences. They're highly unautobiographical. I've never even met a Korean person in my life. I don't know. What do they look like? Tell me. I don't know. <laughs> Tell us about your writing habit. A writing habit? Yeah, habit is right. <laughs> it's an addiction. <laughs> I can't stop. Um, well, I wake up at 11, and then uh, oh, I used to live in Lower East Side, and this guy named Carlo would bring me my, my uh, egg white omelet, but oh, now I just moved to, to, to the Union Square area, and uh, I don't know what I'm going to do, but somebody's supposed to bring me breakfast. <laughs> then from 12 to 4, I actually write. Okay. Uh, then at 5, I see my uh, psych a psychiatrist, you know, at the... Uh, all the other writers also see them along Park and Fifth <laughs> Avenues, and then at six thirty we go to Cafe Sabarsky, which has a nice Viennese theme for our for our cafe <laughs> mit, mit yeah, schlag. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. We got a lot of schlag. Then we drink a lot. Uh, then we collapse and cry for a while, uh, and then you know, eight or nine hours of sleep, and then I wake up and repeat the cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a terrible life. You know? <laughs> Somebody's got to. So, well. Uh, it's worse than a Welsh miner's life, I think. <laughs> well, the pay is less. <laughs> Any other concerns? Uh, is it difficult naming your book? Mm. Just kind of, like, just kind of yeah, I'm trying to create less stupid titles with each new book. Um, <laughs> Super Sad True Love Story was a tough one. Uh, the, the initial title was really dumb. It was, uh, oh God, don't blog about this or post this on the YouTube. It was a... Uh, Army of Love. God, that's a dumb title. What happened was I went to, to the, the U.S. Army asked me to go visit their, um, you know, their facilities uh, to read to the soldiers. You know, and I said, they said, you know, maybe Afghanistan, maybe Kandahar province. I said, it's okay. Why don't we just go to Germany or something like that? <laughs> so I went there, and there were a lot of troops, and, and, and they, you know, and, and, and uh, they asked me what my next book was going to be called, and I said, oh, I'm the Army of Love. And they were like, permission to speak freely, sir. That is the dumbest title we've ever had. <laughs> so thanks to the grunts. Um, that would have been terrible, terrible. And then we did focus. It was not good. <laughs> what a wonderful thing that the Army asked you to read to the troops. Yes, the, the, there's a library, and they're trying to get the troops to read books. Uh, oh, my yeah. God. No, no. I mean, the Xbox is good, but the books are even better. Russia. Yeah, I go back every year. Uh, it's hard not to go back when your reviews in Russia are, you know, balding trader betrays motherland, and <laughs> Steingart pleases his American masters, you know. It's, it's a bring your own pogrom time. <laughs> BYOP. I'm going back in October for, uh, oh God, the State Department is, <laughs> there's a program called St. Petersburg Reads, and they're making my hometown read an absurdist thing. <laughs> <laughs> We'll see how that goes. Have you started uh, writing your next book, or do you have ideas for your next book? Yeah, yeah. I think my next book is going to be. I, I, you know, stuff like this takes a lot out of you. Um, it's, um, you know, I hope it's fun to read, but it's not always fun to write because you're just imagining a very terrifying future. Um, I, I just did signings across the West Coast, and a lot of people brought the books and had me autograph, saying, "None of this book will ever happen." And then my, my autograph. Um, I want to write, I, I, I've been working on a bunch of essays for a long time, some of which have already appeared in magazines, uh, so, you know, I'm sure it'll be called a memoir when we're done with it, but something like that, and then back to the crazy satire, but everyone needs to relax a little bit. The um, social economic development that's portrayed in the book, the con corporate consolidation people. I started this book in 2006, um, and I, you know, I, Again, growing up in the Soviet Union, you get a good feeling for when things are about to fall apart. Uh, you know, the flags get bigger, the vitriol gets stupider, there's anti-immigrant nonsense. Um, so 2006, I thought, uh, 
when I started this book, I was going to have the banks fall apart. You know, Lehman Brothers collapse. And then I, you know, I took a ride in a Chevy, and I thought, oh, this is not a good car. <laughs> you know, this is no Hyundai Elantra. So I thought, okay, GM and Ford are going to collapse or be bought out by Lando Lakes, which is what happened. <laughs> um, but then as the year, years went on, and I was writing this, all these things started to happen in so many ways. So I constantly had to make it worse and worse until the whole, you know, in the end, the, the whole country gets bought out by a Norwegian hedge fund. Um, <laughs> so that was the again the difficulty of keeping up with the present is that it's just you know our, our downfall, the rise of this country was so meteoric, you know, it was just incredible. It was just this incredible ascent over the course of of, of, of several decades, and I wonder what the descent is going to be like. Um, that was going to be a, one of the titles of this book was, uh, "Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to begin our descent." Uh, but somebody already published a book with that title. Can you believe it? Gosh. Yeah, in the back. Uh, kind of following up on the Russia question, uh, too far. Uh, what is the uh, real uh, kind of uh, your the response of the Russian uh, public or the readers, as opposed to the critics uh, that you've had a chance to interact with? And the uh, second part: What about the uh, immigrant community here? Because obviously you describe it in such wonderful detail in uh, your novels. Uh, what is, uh, if you could say a few words about that? Well, uh, you know, we've sold over 80 copies in Russia, so <laughs> the readership, I think, you know, those 80 people really like me <laughs> and are possibly related to my cousin, you know? <laughs> so uh, I think that it really doesn't make any, you know, there's no. Nobody cares, you know. Uh, Russia has so many of its own satirists, uh, Vladimir Sarok and Viktor Pirevin, that it's really, the books are published, and I think that, you know, the very kind of hipster Williamsburg type elite reads them, you know, because I always get reviewed in those kind of hipsters' magazines. Uh, and, in fact, one was just published, the first chapter of this book was published by a magazine called Snob, which I think <laughs> gives you, it's, a, it's owned by, um, what's his name, Prokhorov, the guy that just bought the Nets. Yeah. It's one of the it's one of the most beautiful magazines I've ever seen. I mean, it's absolutely stunning. It comes in this beautiful shell and it's delivered by DHL or UPS or something. <laughs> um, so I think there really isn't much of an audience there. Uh, Russian immigrants here, you know, when I wrote my first book, Russian Debutants Hand Job or whatever it's called, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, the reason I wrote it is because nobody really, no other Russian of my generation really had a book about us, my generation of Russians coming out. They were, of course, brilliant emigre writers, but nobody who was, you know, like me came when I was seven years old, etc. There were wonderful Indian, Dominican, Korean writers, uh, everything across the spectrum, but nothing really Russian. So that's why I wrote that book. And it was really wonderful when I would go out, not everyone loved the book in, in the Russian-American community, but when I went out on tours, people would say, you know, wow, this is our lives, you know, and, and thanks at least for trying to write what, what our lives are like. And since that book, there have been so many other great Russian writers, Bismosgis, Slava Bakhmiad, etc., so now there's a whole tidal wave of, of other Russians. So it feels good to be, you know, to sort of charge out of the gate. Uh, but I was very embarrassed. I thought my parents would hate it. <laughs> they hated it. Yeah. Um, no, they didn't hate it. Um, but, you know, I, I, you don't want to air the sort of the dirty laundry of your own community the first time around. It's, it becomes a very kind of, you know, like when Philip Roth, not that I'm comparing myself, but when Philip Roth started writing about the Jews and Goodbye Columbus and uh, all the novellas and all the flack that he caught, you know, my father always asked me every time I read books, you know, is this going to be good for the Jews? And I always say, this isn't going to be good for anybody. <laughs> One more question. Dude. One question. I assume you're bilingual. Did you translate your own book? Did you have a translator? Were you pleased with the translation? Uh, the, 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 uh, the second book had a great translator. Uh, it was published by Amphora or Limbus, a great St. Petersburg publishing house. I can't remember which one. The first book, uh, yeah, you know, there was a, it was a very kind of... Um, the, the woman who was translating it, I think she was in her, you know, she wasn't young, and she had a very prim kind of approach to things. So, you know, for example, I, my novels are festooned with genitals on every page, and each time one would come across, she would write the first letter, let's say, and then dot, 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 dot. <laughs> so I spent, I spent months just filling in the genitals. <laughs> And uh, you know, <laughs> that's what Oberlin education prepared me for. <laughs> a lifetime of that. Yeah. No, uh, I'm happy to see, I'm very interested to see what the, you know, how. And, and this, this first chapter of this book was translated by um, Masha Gessen, who is the Keith Gessen's sister, and she's brilliant, and it was a wonderful translation. Jeremy, thank you very much. Thank you.